Texas, if you will. You know, so I was happy about that. Making the grass greener, make you feeling good about the day, rather than looking at brown grass, look at some nice, green, healthy life. Or you can just look at a picture, a screen. If you look at your bulletin, if you notice the thought for the day is in uh, John 14, 12 to 14, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And this quote coming out of uh, object, Christ's object lesson is a condition and a promise that we all should take heed to. And it reads, the condition as the will of man cooperates with the will of God. Notice the promise. It becomes omnipotent. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. All his biddings are enablements. That's the power of God. And you in and me. Let us claim those precious promises by following that easy and simplistic condition. Ladies and gentlemen, your announcements are as follows. There will be fellowship lunch today. All, of course, are invited. There is no food bank this week. Um, Thursday night Bible study will be at 6 p.m. And Sunday night Bible class is at 6 p.m. as well. I want to remind you that there is total doctor care going on in Amarillo. Um, it's all free. And it's at the Amarillo Seventh Day Church. And they're doing doctor visits, screenings. Dental care, eye care, um, just a whole bunch of stuff. You can go get your hair cut, Pat. You know? <laughs> you know they, get or maybe get that, that dog, uh, dog room. It starts at 7 and it goes to 4. And I believe it's first come, first serve. So get there as soon as you can. And you can get it, just a lot of dental work done. I mean, I don't know if they're, Charles said something about pulling teeth. Maybe they'll clean teeth. Maybe they can get a roof in now. They're going to pull teeth? I need to I mean, you see what they're doing on this picture? They look like they're doing something. They can, they can pull. But they they also, go. if you need glasses, they will check your eyes. Your glasses will be free. It'll just take a week or more for them to come in. See, if you get in line, they get it done. <laughs> So you gotta, uh, you gotta be there waiting on them like they were a couple of years ago in line at Krispy Kreme. Huh. So maybe take a ten and camp, camp out, you know. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, we are losing precious daylight. You know, me and Pat was uh, commenting earlier. You know, uh, life is short, and now the sun, uh, the sunshine is getting shorter. It's uh, sundown today is at eight twenty-five. Next week is at eight sixteen. Remember to guard the edges of the Sabbath. Give all the blessings that you have deserved. Please stand for the doxology.
Please turn with me to Psalms 119. That is Psalms 119. And we will be reading verses 1 through 9, or excuse me, 9 through 11. That is Psalms 119, verses 9 through 11. When you're there, please say amen. If you haven't got there yet, please ask for mercy. Okay. Psalms 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. You know, we got, a, we got kids, and uh, last week, a few of them were sick. This week, a few more sick down. But I think God, this has been a, a good week as far as rest. Um, at the same time, you know, they're not getting sick enough to go to the hospital. It's just a little big knickknacks that the body's trying to recover from. So it's a blessing just to see them be able to recover. Um, I just want to thank God just in general for uh, my home, my home life, and just the blessings from uh, working here. Uh, I really like my job. A little, I like what I do. Sometimes it gets tiring, you know, but... I like to go to work. You know, God has blessed me by allowing him to work. You know, to keep him out of a, out of danger, if you will. And I really see the blessing in that. Um, my PTO pump, uh, hydraulic, uh, blasted on me. And uh, I'm just thankful that uh, the holes, you know, didn't, I didn't have no, uh, there's a lot of pressure running through those hoses. And uh, I'm just glad that, uh, it didn't hit me in the face because I was messing with a bungee cord and, it, and I didn't get it hooked on right, really, and it, it, it popped up and hit me in my nose, it came all the way up like that, and I was like, that hurt, <laughs> yeah, that hurt, but hey, I was just thinking, well, I didn't want that hose hitting me like that, because it, 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 I uh, guess uh, I would have been just now getting out of the hospital or something, you know? but, uh, but I'm thankful just for God's mercy upon me. Uh, just the blessings in general, just being safe um, out on the road, just a lot of crazy drivers going on, and people driving uh, irrationally, not making smart decisions, and uh, I guess enjoying their day, I guess, and not paying attention. So, just had a, had a couple of moments out on the road, and I'm thankful that God is just uh, the blessing was there for it to be enough that I'm able to make it home safe, you know. So, God has just been working in my life so wonderfully. And I'm just thankful that he would uh, look out for poor old little Randy, you know, bless me the way he does. And I know he's blessed you, and I would like for you to share. Now I would like to open up the floor for uh, anybody who would like to lead us in 456 in your hymn of my Lord and I. If not, then I will be the backup singer. All right. I don't know this song very well, but we'll get to it. Please stand. Four, five, six.
chapter 15, verse 20. John chapter 15, verse 20. John 15, verse 20 says, I can't hear you. Here's the other microphone. It's John 15. Some reason that one's not on. Okay. Just a <laughs> we may have to check the batteries in. John, John chapter 15, verse 20. And it says, Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Are there any special prayer requests? I'd like to pray for my mother, Irma. Irma? Yes, please. What's your grandson's name, Philip? Your grandson, what's his name? Oh, uh, Gio. G Gio? Yes, sir. Okay, let us humbly kneel before God. Father in heaven, in the sweet name of Jesus and through the power of your Holy Spirit, we boldly come before your throne right now. We can weary physically, but more than conquer is spiritually. Heavenly Father, you know the deep secret things about us individually. You see the filth that is not seen publicly. Cleanse that filth, Lord. That's what we are coming here at this point right now for deliverance for. Those secret sins that so easily beset us. Cleanse us that we may do your will and your work with clean hands, clean tongues, clean eyes, and clean minds. Lord, we pray that this will be a blessed day for you, a great moment for you. We pray that you would accept our worship. Thank you for your kindness, your tender love and mercy. Keep us ever mindful that the greatest blessings are the ones that we don't even see. For you work tirelessly, Lord, for our salvation. Allow us to humble ourselves, and cooperate with you. Lord, I pray that you would put it on everybody's heart to read Isaiah 58. Not just for intellectual knowledge, but for an experience. You're coming back for those who have an experience with you, not a knowledge, alone. Father God, thank you for the progress that Esther has made we await her return. Be with Randy's home, the kids. 
be with the church home family in general. Be with Katherine Parker. Give her wisdom, Lord, on how to proceed. Give her comfort in her times of pain. But I just want to just lift Pat up to you in general. To help this man. We also pray that there would not be any violence taking place tomorrow as people will receive free medical care. Allow them to see Jesus in every volunteer that's there. Let hearts be touched and pride be vanquished. Be with the families of the many victims. There's so much stuff that takes place. Only you know everything, Lord. And I know it has to be tough to see what's taking place on this earth. But soon, soon, Jesus is coming. He's going to put an end to this madness. Be with the homeless, Lord. Let them know they are not forgotten. Be with Irma. Bless her beyond what she can think and ask, Lord. Also, I, I lift up a special prayer for Philip's grandson, Gio. I also lift up his mother, Lord. And I thank you uh, for Philip's willingness to stand in the gap and raise his grandson. Give him heavenly help from angels, Lord. It's not easy. Raising your grandkids. But all things can be done through Christ that strengthens us. Father God, without a shadow of a doubt, we know you have heard and have already answered in advance these prayers. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Praise God for having a very successful week at work this week. Um, things were going my way. I got all the loads that they have given me plus some done. And I would just like to remind you all that that doesn't mean because God is the one who sustains us. It says in the word of God, not because of what a man might be doing or some man may have done in the past, but one of these days, this, 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 this money, the gold and the silver is going to be nothing. It's not going to mean anything. And the test is going to be there. Who really sustains you? Is it the, the uh, United States Treasury? Hmm. Or is it the king, kingdomly blessings and grace that is coming down from heaven? We have to get a firm idea to hold on. God is the one sustaining us. And that's part of paying tithes to the Lord. Helping us understand. Not only did he give us a commandment, but he gave us a life lesson. That lesson is he is the one who sustains us. No matter our situation. He knows we need clothes on our back. He knows we need food in our belly. He knows we need a roof over our head. He knows these things. And he loves us more than these sparrows. More than these foxes who even have holes. You will have that which God has provided for you if you trust in him. And furthermore, he's got a, heaven, a, a, a heavenly mansion await, uh, awaiting you. Let us by faith go there now and stay there. Will the deacons please come forth? Heavenly Father, you suffered the children of Israel to hunger so that they would know that it is you who sustains them. Heavenly Father, we just pray and ask as we give back to you that which you have given to us, it is get, it, it, that it will get planted in our mind very firmly and we'll be settled on the truth that it is you who sustains us. Heavenly Father, we ask that these monies that go towards your gospel and furthering your kingdom, 
uh, you would just bless them ten, ten times over, Lord, in the hearts to the ones who have uh, given. Uh, we may not know what's being done with it, but we can rest assured, Lord, that our part has been done. And that you have asked us, as far as financially, what you have asked us financially has been done. Lord, I just pray and ask that we are cheerful givers and that we continue to show our faithfulness and our trust in you. In your precious name, amen. amen. Esther has been greatly improved. Six weeks ago when she started this ordeal, in her with her leg it was she could hardly move or walk. The infection was so great that her leg was about twice its normal size. But through the medication, the surgeries, various things. She's doing very well and will be home Tuesday for three weeks. And then she will have a new knee put in. And then when she comes home, she'll be able to walk. Right now she can't walk except with a walker. Because she cannot bend one knee because there's no knee in. But we praise God that he's blessing her and thank you so much for your prayers. I've uh, been spending a lot of time sitting in a room visiting, just being there. It's been very slow for Esther. The days go by slow. There's not a lot to do when you're just sitting in a chair. That's all she's been doing. She's getting rather scurtured and anxious to get home. Before we begin our message this morning, let's bow our heads for a moment. Our loving Father, we thank you for an opportunity to open your word today. And we pray that you will bless us with understanding, that we may know your will and your way is our prayer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to talk about four stories. There are four truths in each story. There may be more. You probably can find some. But we're going to look at four. But it's the same four truths in all four stories. But you heard the story. They're Bible stories. The first one is about a, a young lady, a young Jew. She won the national 
beauty contest or lottery, whatever you want to call it, to be the queen. But nobody knew that she was a Jew. So she had hoped that that, that would make life just continue on to be pleasant and no big problems. But there was a problem. There was one person in the kingdom, a high official, that hated Jews. And he threw intrigue and some deception. He was able to get a law passed that on a certain date, all the Jews in the kingdom of Persia would be killed. Remember, it was Persia, Medo Persia, that conquered Babylon. And it was in this time frame when Persia was the main ruling power in the then known world. She found out about this. And so she went to the king and asked to have a very special dinner. And in that special dinner, she exposed two things. She exposed the plan that Naaman had to kill all the Jews and exposed the fact that she was a Jew. Now the queen. Well, the end of the story is quite different. Instead of uh, the Jews being killed on this day, the king did some things to, to rectify that and make it possible for them to survive. And the Jews were very happy and praising God, uh, singing and dancing on that day. And Haman ended up dying on his own gallows that he had designed to kill his most hated Jew. That's story number one. Story number two. Four Hebrews were taken prisoner. Along with many others, but we know the story of these four. They, uh, they were Jews. And especially this one Daniel decided he was not going to hide the fact that he was a Jew. And when they were taken to toward Babylon, they were now eating special food provided by the king and drinking special wine. Except Daniel and his three buddies said no. We are not going to eat that. Not only is it unclean to us, it is unhealthy, and we're not going to defile our bodies with it. We're going to honor our God. And so they asked for a, a, uh, uh, a test. Ten days on vegetables and water the end of that test, they were doing so well, they were able to continue that diet. Then they were enrolled in the, the uh, best university in all of the land, most prestigious university in Babylon. And once they graduated and were tested, they were ten times smarter, ten times better, than all of the other graduates. So they ended up on as one of the king's counselors. Except a problem. The king had a dream. He couldn't remember the dream. So he 
He called in all of his, his faithful priests and soothsayers and all of the rest of them. And he told them, I can't remember the dream, but it's very important. I want you to tell me the dream and tell me the interpretation. And no one could. The king got so upset, he made a decree that all of you folks are going to die. And it included Daniel and his three guys that were with him as recent graduates, what I call rookie wise men. Daniel got an audience with the king. He said, if you just give me it tonight, I'll tell you the dream tomorrow. He was given the time and he went home and they had a prayer meeting. I'd love to have been in that prayer meeting. The magic was a pretty serious one. And then Daniel went to sleep. The very fact that he could go to sleep tells me so much about him. That he was not worried. He trusted in God. So he could sleep and the Lord gave him the dream and gave him the interpretation. The next day, he goes to the king. He tells him the dream. He tells him the interpretation. The king is so amazed, he falls at his feet and praises the God of Daniel. Story number three. Those three buddies were out on a plane outside of Babylon in front of a 90 foot golden image Nebuchadnezzar said this, this is me I'm not just the head of gold I'm the whole thing and when the music plays you're to bow down and worship and when everybody bowed down the three stood out like three big sore thumbs because you could see them all through there. Everyone's down on their face. And here's these three Hebrews standing. They were brought to the king. And he was, he was extremely upset. He was going to give them another chance. And they said, no. We don't need another chance. If our God can, our God can save us. But if not, we're not going to bow down to it anyway. But the king had the matter and asked for the fiery furnace to be heated seven times more than normal. And be thrown in so they threw these three fellows in. The soldiers that threw them in died from the heat. And there they were, walking around as though there wasn't any fire anywhere in the kingdom. None so hard but near, but they're there. They're in the middle of it. What? And Nebuchadnezzar gets off of his, his chair and he looks and he sees four of them. And he describes one that looks like a god. He calls them to come out. And makes a decree. If anyone speaks against the God of these three Hebrews, he will kill them. That night in Babylon, what was the subject of the conversation in the various homes? Was it about that 90 foot golden image or about three faithful sons of God that lived through a seven time hotter fiery furnace? And the king's new decree a belief in that God. Story number four. The same Daniel. Older now. Kings have come and gone. Kings have bought. Uh, and even, even the nation has come and gone. It's a new nation now. 
new country, but Daniel's still there next to the king. He's still in leadership in the, in the kingdom, trusting. And those that were also in similar positions hated Daniel and they decided that they were going to come up with a, a scheme in order to eliminate him. So they got the king to make a decree, anybody that worships anyone but him, for the next 30 days, they would be thrown into the den of lions. That very day, Daniel goes home three times in the day with his window open facing Jerusalem and prays like he always did. He didn't change. They were counting on that and as soon as they had the evidence, they were at the king saying, oh, we got the guy now. The king tried to, to save Daniel, but the law couldn't be changed. And so they threw him into the lion's den. And then the king spent a, a sleepless night praying to Daniel's God. <coughs> praying that Daniel would be saved. Of course, Daniel's in the lion's den, and I believe he was praying too, you see, with those lions around him. And uh, very early in the morning, he's at the top, looking down into the lion's den, and he said, Oh, Daniel, did you hear, is your God able to save you from the lions? And the answer is yes. Well, someone might say, well, the lions weren't hungry, but we know that's not the case because those that accused and came up with the, the scheme to kill Daniel, the king had thrown in the lion's den with their wives and their children. And the Bible says the lions had their bones broke before they hit the body. They were hungry. There was no question. I said there are four truths in these four stories. The same truths in all of them. If I were to have a whiteboard up here and ask you, we could probably name three of them pretty easily. The first one, truth number one, persecution, is the expected modus operandi of the devil. I want you to notice evil with a D is the devil. Okay? In his great controversy, warfare, this is to silence the divine allies and exiles. We are all exiles. I've had one sermon so far about exiles. It was about a little girl taken to Syria and how she witnessed to the general of the Syrian army. This is another story about exiles. All four stories. The people were in exile. They weren't home. We are all exiles. We're going to find that out as we continue. 2 Timothy 3, Paul tells us, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It is, has been the devil's goal to silence God's people. In the first century, the persecution began. In the second century, it expanded tremendously. It was Rome that was persecuted. And then the persecution changed as time went along. 
And we got to the fourth and the fifth centuries, and it's now the church that's persecuting, no longer just the state. But persecution has been part of the devil's plan to silence God's people. He doesn't want to hear it. He doesn't want you to talk. Truth number two. Trials and tribulations grow character and dependency on God. We all have trials. We all have tribulations. But in this country, it seems persecution has not been real strong, but it's getting strong. The hatred for Christians is growing. God has been kicked out of the school. They want God kicked out of everything. And this country is becoming harder and harder to be Christian in your business dealings, in your contacts. Children are, are laughed at at school. Some are even persecuted in their home when they become Christian. We're finding persecution is growing. There's been parts of the world where there have been many martyrs. Persecution's been there. We haven't had the martyrs here yet. But we have had a growing number of persecutions. John told us, well, actually, John recorded this. These are words of Jesus just hours before he goes to the cross. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. But this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. That's what Jesus is telling you. His disciples is what he's telling you and me. I have overcome the world. And he'll make that possible for us. Peter tells us, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. When Peter and John were persecuted there in Jerusalem, put in prison, and they got out, they were they were praising God that they were able to suffer for Christ's sake. Jesus said they as, as Walter read, they persecuted him, they will persecute his, his followers. Truth number three. Persecution keeps the line of demarcation between the exile and the culture of the capture. Please. In Babylon, Daniel remained firm even though it was in Babylon. And whenever there was persecution, he stood for Christ. He took, stood for God in spite of it. They kept the demarcation between as the captive and the captive. Clean, we weren't assimilating. In fact, Walter Brugman, in his, uh, in his book, wrote, the great problem for exiles is cultural assimilation. The primary threat to those ancient Jews was that members of the community would decide that Jewishness was too demanding or too dangerous or too costly and simply accept Babylonian definitions 
the modes of reality. You see, we want to fall in that same category sometimes. Want to be accepted. That being a Christian sometimes is too demanding, <coughs> too costly. And we want to assimilate. And assimilate is our enemy in this regard. Jesus in his prayer just before he went to the cross. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, he's speaking to the Father, but that you protect them from the evil one, the one with a D in front of him, the evil one with a D, that they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. We are not to be of the world, but in the world, but not of it. Truth number four. This one, most of us probably haven't seen. Persecution actually grows the kingdom of God. When Esther was able to, to point out who the enemy was to the king, and a result could be, uh, a resolution could be come, come in to save the Jews. It was great. It says, in every province and in every city to which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating. And we usually stop right there with the story. It's over. It's great. We seldom read the last part of this verse. Notice I have Esther 8 verse 17a. That's the first part of the verse. What does the second part say? Pay attention. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. Because of what had happened, the Jews grew. The Gentiles that wanted to become Jews became Jews. Way back then. I find it fascinating and interesting that Esther's husband, Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, is the Artaxerxes that actually gave the final decree to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. As a result of this, as a result of Esther. So, and it's that date in history, his decree in history that starts the 490 year prophecy, the 70 week prophecy of Daniel 9 that points to Jesus, tells when Jesus will come. That same day is the beginning day that we can look at that begins the longest time prophecy in the, in the whole Bible found in Daniel 8 verse 14 the 2,300 day and a day equals a year prophecy. That's the beginning day. Because of this, because of Esther, because of the attitude to God's people changing. King Nebuchadnezzar, when Daniel told the dream, and the interpretation. The Bible says he fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and an incense be presented to him. He began to accept Daniel's God. The three Hebrew words walking in the fiery furnace, came out of the furnace 
When they were called, they didn't come out until Nebuchadnezzar called them. He threw them in. They're walking with Jesus. I wouldn't come out either if I was walking with Jesus. I want to stay there. But as soon as he called them, they came out. And this was his decree. I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned to power. For no other God can save in this way. In the very next chapter in Daniel, after Nebuchadnezzar spends seven years eating grass, having a, a, a terrible time of humility, he finally comes to fully and completely acknowledge God. And he gives in the Bible his own testimony. This is part of the Bible written by King Nebuchadnezzar. He wrote this himself. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven when you glorify anything, you're worshiping it. Because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to to him, and no telling what will happen. In the second century, a fellow by the name of Tertullian, a Roman, said the blood of Christians, Christian martyrs, is seed. The gospel grew. People continued to want to be a Christian. The church started in Jerusalem. Three and a half years after Jesus' death, there was another death. The great persecution broke out. And Stephen, a deacon, was killed by the Sanhedrin. It says on that day in Acts 1 and verse 8, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. They had just been in Jerusalem, but now they're leaving. They're going to the various cities and towns trying to get away from the persecution. And what do they do? It says those who had been scattered preached the word everywhere they went. Persecution grows the church. Remember the scripture reading this morning. Jesus said, remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. For if they persecute me, they will persecute you also. We know as we study the book of Revelation, especially chapter 13, that there's going to come a time when God's people will be faced with a big decision. How many of you believe Jesus is coming soon? How soon? Very soon? Very soon. Well, let me tell you, before Jesus comes, sooner than that, persecution will come. You read in the last part of Revelation 13 about the mark of the beast. And those that do not have it will not, be able, will not be able to buy or sell and it even talks about martyrs. If you ever need the faith of a martyr, God will give it to you then. You don't have it now. I don't have it now. But if I have my faith today, for today, in Jesus, and every day with Jesus, today, then when that time comes, and I need to stand true and tall, even though it's 
the end of my life for him, as it was for Peter when he was crucified, for Paul when he was beheaded, for Stephen when he was stoned. He will give me that faith, what I need. He'll give it to you. We don't need to be concerned. But the persecution that I read that's going to happen before Jesus comes, if Jesus is coming real soon, it's coming soon. To be ready for it, all we can do is give ourselves totally and completely to Jesus every day. Now. Live by faith all day in a personal relationship. And that is the best preparation. We don't need to worry how we're going to face it. Because the Lord will then give us the faith, the strength to go through it. In the last few sermons I talked about the Holy Spirit and in one of them I talked about how the Holy Spirit wants to be poured out and the Greek word being poured out in our lives is like a waterfall I want you to notice in this picture where this waterfall is everything's green everything's alive everything is beautiful because when the Holy Spirit is being poured out in your life, it's alive for Him. It's beautiful. It's all in, in pristine as far as the Lord sees. And He will make it a place. He'll make your life a peaceful place. No matter what the problem, no matter what the persecution, or the stresses. If you're filled, you'll be like this peaceful. You're being continually filled with His Spirit, like this peaceful scene that we have here. Shall we bow our heads, our loving Father? We are so thankful that we can trust You. That whatever happens in the future, we know that if we give You ourselves every day, every moment you will protect us, you will guide us and we will bring honor and glory to you no matter what happens to us we want you to be honored you to have the glory this is our prayer in Christ's name we pray